Hey friends, welcome back to Embrace the Question. We are doing our Bible Study with Me series, and I am having a blast. I'm learning a lot. I hope that you are also. I want to say thank you for joining us on this journey, and I have, I'm, I'm learning a lot from you and what you're putting in the comments as well. It's amazing to me how many different angles the body of Christ absorbs uh, and one person can't cover them all. So you need to be a part of a community, i.e. the church, in order to get as much of a picture as you can. Because, as I said, one person's just not going to absorb it all. So I hope that you're reading the comments. Please leave some comments, put some observations in there, ask, ask questions. That's where a lot of this comes from. And uh, we're, we're just trudging along at our own pace. So let's get on with Genesis chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel. All right, going to continue on with the English Standard Version. This week we may switch back and forth again to the, the King James if we're actually looking at some words, but we'll see how that goes. And I also have a few graphics to show you as well. So hang in there and remember, share this with somebody that needs to do a Bible study. Thank you very much. All right, Genesis chapter, well, chapter 11. How about we start there? And we're going to do our five verse uh, sections so that we can talk about this as we go. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. I don't like that. Uh, to me, that is a little bit too basic, maybe. Let's switch to King James. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. If we actually look at the Strong's here, this is the word for language, very close to the word for book, which is sefer. This is sefa. The second form is in dual and plural, probably from this word, Safa, looks the same, or Shafa. So the, the difference there is the letter that they use to create the word, the, the sheen or the sheen, through the idea of termination, the lip, the language, Mm, the band of the bank, the binding, the border. So we're talking about like an ed, a, a river bank, or you can think of uh, a levee. But this, these are the the boundaries of communication. Okay, that's what a a language is, and one speech. Speech is debar. It's the very same word as the Hebrew word word debar devar. Again, uh, some, of, some of the consonants in Hebrew are a bit interchangeable depending on the context, like bet and vet, a B and a V. So we have the word debar or devar. And it literally means word or a spoken thing. Uh, let's see what else it says here. Because of a book, because of a book business, care, case, cause, chronicles, that makes sense, song, speech, spoken, talk. So what, what you say. So the boundaries of your communication is your language and what you actually say is your speech. And that is what was being developed in this area where the people have aggregated, okay? It's, um, probably worth noting that there is a place that comes on the map maybe later in, in our history uh, or later in our future from this point called Lodabar. That was where Mephibosheth, I believe, was from, was Lodabar. Lo means no. So Lodabar means no word. There's a place of a dryness of the word, Lodabar. Okay, you can take that and read up on that story in the Chronicles and the Kings, I think. 
and uh, it really opens up a world there because Lodabar means famine for the word. All right. So we've got a development of a language and a speech. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make, for, make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. That just seems like an odd word for the English Standard Version, bitumen. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. All right, and as the people migrated, they, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Let's take a look at Shinar. All right, now Shinar, this is a map from Carl Musser, and you'll see the approximate location of many of these, these ruins. Uh, we've, we're nestled here in the Fertile Crescent, or in Mesopotamia, which is a land that was fertile because of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. This is where we think that the Garden of Eden was initially. It was because when we go back to Genesis, we know that we recognize the name Euphrates. It's, it came out of Eden. Okay, so we can start by saying that people haven't gone very far yet. They have still, they're still migrating. If the mountains of Ararat are in Turkey, then this area right here, see my cursor, is where the ark landed. Okay, it's where, it's where it finally came to rest after the flood. Now, right about here in the bend is where Ur is. That's where Abraham comes from. And then Babylon is right up here, the city of Babylon, where, where we think the ruins are in Iraq today. Okay, so you can see it is very, it is very much in central Iraq, really close to the, the modern city of Baghdad. All right, this is where Shinar is, right here. And they said one another, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. The interesting thing for me about this is that they're making bricks not because they necessarily prefer bricks, but there just aren't any stones in that valley, in that area. It's, it's devoid of stone. It's very much famous for clay. It is a, an alluvial plain created by the rivers. So there's a lot of mud. Uh, these guys are making bricks and they're firing them, which means that they, they have a little bit of know-how. You can let sun, the sun bake bricks for you, but there is an additional strength to firing them and not to mention an increase of productivity. So these guys were in a hurry. They were trying to build something permanent, okay? And they're using the very slime, the bitumen, uh, that also comes out of many of the tar pits in the area. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's widely known, I think, amongst at least in the, in the academic realm, that the ancient ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah were around these hot tar pits. So a lot of people believe that it, they were obviously volcanically fed or volcanically heated. So there was some volatility to the ground around some of these areas. All right, they're using this for mortar. And as I understand it from what I've read, once you fire bricks and you, you uh, secure them together with this kind of mortar, they become extraordinarily strong, okay? Then they said, come let us build for ourselves a city. Before we get too far into the city, and I have, I have another graphic to show you, the idea of brick is one of slavery. I don't know 
that these guys had in had enslaved peoples to do their work yet. We know that that comes around for Egypt, right? And Egypt is forcing Israel to build what? The Hebrew people are building bricks. And so bricks become an actual symbol for slavery. Part of that is the nature of a brick. A brick is a uniform object. It has no character to it at all. It is simply a, a rectangular object. It, it's, simply, it's simply a brick. It has no distinguishing features from the next brick. Unlike rock, with rock, you have to be you have to be shaped somewhat, but rocks maintain their own original character most of the time. If you're going to take a rock and you're going to chip it down to the shape of a brick, you might as well just use brick. People use rocks because rock has character all in itself. Now we're to the difference between the Tower of Babel and say, Solomon's temple, where they did use stone. They didn't use brick. The workers would chisel the stone for exact fit, but that is metaphoric for us who are stones also being chiseled in order to fit in God's eternal temple. So we have this juxtaposition between rocks and brick, rocks being a freedom. There is a rule that we're introduced to very soon uh, with altars where God says, do not use brick, use rock. It must be unshaped stone. And th that tells us a lot about what God believes about this idea of making everyone the same, this idea of uniformity. There's a difference between unity and uniformity. God is for unity, but he's very much against uniformity. All right, next verse. Then they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, this is one artist's rendition of the Tower of Babel. You can see that Naturally, it's not finished. It never gets finished. But almost every rendition of this tower that you're going to see is going to show a basic pyramidal design. Most of them are at least rounded on the edges. Some, like this one, are completely round. There is an idea that it was built with a spire going all the way to the top. So it was, it was being built with a spire uh, or a ramp that circles the outside for its ascent. We don't know how far they got. We know they started it, or at least it was well into its planning phase. Obviously, in this particular image, it's built right on the Euphrates River, which is probably correct. And I like the fact that the artist didn't put like this massive, uh, this massive city on the outskirts. It was probably quite rural. There, there wasn't like a ton of population to settle anywhere yet. So this, I think, is a pretty good image to give us an idea of at least uh, what the Tower of Babel may have looked like. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. It's interesting that at the pinnacle of man's achievement, God has to descend in order to see what they have done. So that kind of puts things into perspective. Why had they decided to build this huge tower, or at least huge to them? It's because they didn't want to be dispersed. They didn't want to they didn't want to follow through on the be fruitful and multiply throughout the earth. They would rather focus their power within a city. I know that we have a bad taste in our mouth already from this idea of the city because who created the first city? It was Cain. Cain, of course, was our first murderer. 
So this idea of settling in cities, there's something inherently wrong with it in, I think, our, our psyche. However, it's worth noting that we started out in a garden, but in Revelation, at the end of this cycle, we see ourselves in a city. So we are heading to a city. In fact, it was Abraham that was seeking a city built by God. So there's this idea, and I don't know how early man got this idea that cities were a power focus, and it was the, it was whatever the ambition of man was that influenced the the overall goodness of a city. We're going to talk more about that as we go. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there, go down and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. There's our unfinished tower. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. They're one people, they have one language. This is the beginning of what they will do. Nothing they propose to do will be impossible. This idea of unity is a powerful idea to the point where God said, if I leave them completely united and completely un able to understand one another in motive, in speech, in all their forms of communication, then they will be able to do anything. They will be united and that will be enough. We will continue to see this theme in scripture. In the New Testament, we see the disciples in the upper room in one accord. That's not a car, right? That is one, as one, they were worshiping. As one, they were seeking the Spirit of the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon them and gave them what? A language. He reversed this. He reversed the confusing of the languages with what? A confusing language. He reversed it by giving them tongues. Pentecost was the reversal of Babel. Pentecost was, again, the giving of one speech to a people that were united in one accord. It's odd that Pentecost gave a language that was not understandable by people. It was a reunification of people through a single language that nobody could understand. Now you ask yourselves, could people really do anything they want if they're unified? The Lord thought that they were able to do enough not to thwart his plans, but to get into trouble themselves. Because I think we are all quite keen on this notion that there is nothing man can do to thwart the plans of God. If God decides to do something, if he decides to flood the world, a taller tower isn't going to save us, right? So, the Lord dispersed, he confuses the tongue so that we cannot dig a deeper hole, basically. Verse 10, these are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arphaxad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arphaxad 500 years, and he had other sons and daughters. When Arphaxad had lived, one, had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Arphaxad lived after he fathered Shelah 403 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. And Peleg had lived 
When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Ru. And Peleg lived, after he fathered Ru, 209 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Ru had lived 32 years, he fathered Sarug. And Ru lived, after he fathered Sarug, 207 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Sarug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Sarug lived, after he fathered Nahor, 200 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived, after he fathered Terah, 119 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Okay, so we've, we're following a lineage from Noah to Abram. And this is where we get all of our timelines in the, in the, in the Bible. I mean, if you want to put one together yourself, it is a, a bit tedious, but pretty fun activity. We see that the lifespans are getting shorter and shorter as we go. Verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, or Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Now Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife is Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Izcah. Now Sarai was barren, she had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. All right. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Okay. This is the, the very front end of the story of Abram. And we learn that Abram's father is Terah. Now, he, uh, Abram had two brothers, Nahor and Haran. Haran was the father of Lot, the nephew of Abram. So when Haran dies, uh, it becomes Abram who is the caretaker of his nephew. All right, we can kind of follow that. And Abram and Nahor take wives. Abram takes a, a beautiful woman named Sarai who is barren. She can have no kids. We find out down here in the days of, uh, let's see, wrong verse. Right here in verse 31. They went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Okay, now I know what the next chapter starts with, so I'm not really wanting to go there just yet, but let's just ask this question. Was Terah called in the same way that Abraham was called? Because we know that Abram is called to go into a land that God would show him. It makes you wonder, was Terah called first? And he just didn't come through with it. He didn't follow through. He stops. He stops. Where did he stop? In Haran. Now, I know that's a little confusing. Where's Haran? Well, we're not sure exactly. I mean, we could probably find it on an old map, but Haran was Abraham's brother. Is this a, is this a land that maybe Terah thought was really cool and he decided to settle there and then he called it Haran? Or was this an existing piece of land settled, perhaps, called Haran. So if we go back to our map, we can see that Haran is quite a ways, I guess, if you're hoofing it. Uh, or again, Ur was down here. This is where they came from. And they're coming up this way towards Canaan. And this is how far they got. So my question still remains. Was T Terah called instead of Abram, but just didn't get there. Well, I hope you enjoyed this study. This was hard. My voice is going out and I'm really struggling. I guess it's allergy season. Are you guys having issues too? But uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Hope you're hanging in there with me. To me, this is getting pretty meaty. I like 
very much the story of Abram. And we're really going to get into some almost storybook-like stuff in the coming days. So listen, I hope that you have a blessed week. And until the next lesson, peace. Peace.